Thank you, yes. I'll be your killer moderator today. Thank you for coming. We do have an awesome panel. I work at YouTube in a group called uh, Programming Strategy, and a lot of what we do within our team is try to understand what works on YouTube, why it works, and then help get that in the hand of YouTube creators. And we have people who are very smart about the platform here. I thought it'd be good to start if we could just have all of you introduce yourselves and a bit about how your role kind of overlaps with YouTube. I think we're starting here with Rhett and Link first, but are we playing with the video all queued up? Okay, we got the video queued up. We'll start with the video then. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Roll the tape. So as you can tell, we are, hold your applause, please. Uh, we are complete idiots on the internet. I think that's, we've made that abundantly clear. Um, but I'm less of, I'm the, the lesser idiot. <laughs> okay, time will tell. This is a, an hour long panel. Um, so we have a YouTube channel or a couple of them and we've been doing YouTube full time since 07. So, um, that's pretty much our life at this point. And uh, that's just a, kind of a taste of what we do. So that's how it overlaps with us. We, uh, it's our life and uh, in respect to this panel and what we're talking about, we did, we were discovered on YouTube for a show on IFC that we ended up, it was an adaptation of something we were doing online, so. Yeah, all right, we'll dig into more details in a little bit, but we have another clip now, is that right? Another clip? You were gonna leave us for Here. good, weren't you? We're not leaving. Get up, now. Now what are we supposed to do, huh? How are we supposed to get him back? This is all your fault. This whole thing is your fault. You wanna play the game? You really wanna go there? Take a hard look at yourself, son. Come on, let's go. Me. Come on! Fucking hands off me! All right, don't me! <laughs> Nice. Right. That was great. I hadn't seen that yet. All right, so maybe you could introduce yourself as well and kind of what role YouTube has played in getting that film. Uh, yeah. Uh, Josh Wiggins. We, uh, me and my friend uh, Tommy started a little YouTube channel after seeing, you know, like the YouTubers. We thought, that looks fun. Let's do it. And um, my friend was in the short film of Hellion. And um, by the time Kat wrote the, uh, the feature, he didn't really want to do it anymore. So... Um, the casting director, when she looked at the YouTube video, she saw me and she said, hey, let's have this kid come in and audition. So I did, like three or four times, and the last one was in LA with Aaron. So um, yeah, YouTube had a huge, huge part in that, so. Nice, All right, I think that's it for the videos, but Lance, it'd be great if you could talk a little bit about your role and how YouTube has played a part. Sure, um, well, I, I head up the uh, digital original um, area at Warner Brothers. And it's our kind of a experimental area for the studio. Um, I guess on the, the other side of it, too, I'm on the feature side uh, producing features for, for them. But uh, in regards to YouTube, I, they kind of saved us because we, we committed to make, I think it was three different um, long-form, series-driven, they were really digital movies. We committed to make these for the space without any kind of distribution in place. And... We were really lucky to link up with YouTube and find a home for, we have a, one series that's called H Plus that we did in partnership with Brian Singer. Yep. And uh, that's actually, we have a channel for that, for that series. It's 48 episodes and about four hours of content. And uh, we've just written a second one of those. And then we came out of the gate pretty strong. We, we did, a, did a thing around Mortal Kombat, our game franchise. Um, and, and I oversaw all of the digital stuff that we've done so far, and we've got a pretty big slate of projects. We've got about 20 things that we're working on with the highest level talent, but also, you know, finding people. And Mortal Kombat is, is a perfect example of that. We'll probably get into that. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. All right, uh, Nina, can you talk a little bit about what you do at Full Screen? Sure. My name's Nina Kammer. I work at Full Screen, and Full Screen 
is a new media company. We work on the YouTube platform, and we really are responsible for finding and powering the creation of the next generation of artists and storytellers on YouTube um, through borderless boundaries and basically uh, connecting them with brands, growing their channels, and helping them monetize them. We're referred to as a multi-channel network. Nice. And uh, Steve, can you talk a little bit about what you do at UTA? Yeah, so my name is Steve Cohen. I'm an agent in the talent department there. Um, <coughs> and UTA is one of the three largest talent agencies in the world. Um, and several years ago, we basically decided to devote a lot more time and resources into you know, exploring the YouTube platform, finding talent, comedians, writers, um, bloggers, people in the fashion and beauty space, to take them from where they were and transition them into more um, traditional and more mainstream entertainment mediums, film, television, and stuff like that. And we've, uh, we've signed a lot of them and been able to do that. Excellent. Uh, and I should probably mention that I was also got my start on YouTube. The first video I did was the Obama Girl video for a channel called Barely Political. And after that video came out, I actually left my job and started doing YouTube videos basically full time. So there you go. I'm a moderator and also uh, a creator. Uh, so first question here is probably most relevant to uh, Steve and Nine, although many of you might be able to speak to it. When you're kind of looking at YouTube talent, what do you look for aside from just the views and the number of subscribers, what do you look for in talent? Well, for me, you know, when I started, the way to find comedians, and one thing that I've tried to do in my career is find people who like to create, who want to write, direct, act, produce, and a lot of times what you would do is you just go to these comedy clubs and find these young comedians who go on stage, make people laugh, and then have um, ambitions beyond that. But it's sort of, for me, the same type of thing where this is just a different platform. And, you know, in 2006, six, seven, when, when young people started putting their videos online, we just got to sit at your desk and, and look for it. And, you know, for me, it's people who are talented, obviously, but also who try to be consistent, who have a point of view. And if you look at their work, you can say, oh, there's a TV show in that, or oh, there's a film in that. Um, because like I said, it, it's sort of, been our job, I think, to take them from where they are to where they want to go, because almost all of them who do that want to be filmmakers and actors and writers. Um, so their, you know, passion is there. You just got to find them. Yeah, I think from uh, like the democratized uh, platform that YouTube offers, you have thousands and thousands of people creating videos every day. So. We at Full Screen have a tool that we call Engine, and what that does is it's able to identify tens of thousands of videos that are, we think are popping or that are popping on the platform. Um, it helps us cull through the masses, and then it's actually a pretty tedious job. We have about 30 people plus working and looking at all these videos that pop up on this tool, and we still believe in this pixie dust that, um, you know, there's still going to be, there needs to be human-powered um, looking behind all these videos and really seeing which ones are going to have are going to be the x factor so what we do is we take these emerging artists and we bring them into the, the network and we bring them into the platform and help them grow their channels to be these top youtubers and then for the top youtubers views and subscri subscribers are certainly very uh, important for brands but we're looking for things like watch time and also the consistency of content and again um, to echo uh, what he was saying, the point of view is really important. Um, and we also like to stick to a consistent format so that people know that YouTube is a similar uh, place where they can continue to see content such as TV. But if I can just add something, uh, Nina had alluded to an X factor. And for us, it's a connectivity to your audience. Obviously, you're going to have to have you know, views and people are going to have to be watching you. But that's, the, that connectivity is something that we can sell to the film and television studio systems by basically saying this guy's going to be in a movie or this guy's going to be in a television show and his two million you know youtube uh, page subscribers are going to come to the theater and we've been successful a couple times um in doing that and they're giving us more and more shots and you know just from sort of a more traditional background i work with kevin hart who you know three or four years ago basically showed that to the studio system and has all these twitter followers and was putting out videos and we've been telling them for years that if this guy is in a movie that he's the lead of, they're going to go and see it. And he did a couple of concert films and did that. And he's also in a movie, big movie this weekend that's a, a massive success story ride along. Nice. Anything to add to that, Lance, in terms of what you look for? 
Well, it's crazy. I mean, for, for us, um, and my dream, you know, being in the digital area, but also working with our theatrical group and our TV group, my, our dream is really to make the digital platforms be the ones that are, you know, the most successful, but also have the, you know, possibility to jump and make it into a movie or, or make it into a TV series, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, for us, it's really, you know, it's experimenting, really experimenting with the platform and, and learning about, you know, the fascinating thing about it is as a studio, you don't see the results, you know, when you, when you release a movie. Now you do, but I mean, when you put something on YouTube, you can see instantly what people are saying, if they like it, the traffic, the views, and that for us, you know, as a studio, it's pretty amazing just to have that interaction um, and so quickly. Cool. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about the IFC show more, sort of how, who discovered you and kind of decided to um, help make that show a reality? Sure. Uh, so one of the types of videos that we started to do online was fake, well, they were real local commercials, but they were making fun of the local commercials that you see late at night, you know, the car salesman in a chicken suit kind of thing. So we started to, we started a series called I Love Local Commercials which was actually sponsored by a, a, a bigger brand, but we would go and make a free commercial for a small business somewhere in America, a uh, furniture store. Yeah, the first one was Red House Furniture in High Point, North Carolina. Uh, oh, you love, and, and you're white, right? And you can buy a couch there. That's right. If, if you're black, you could also buy a couch right. there. Any race can buy a couch there. That's the message. That was the tagline of the ad. Red House Furniture, where black people and white people buy furniture. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we lived in North Carolina at the time. We made we made thirteen of those. Red House is one of them. Uh, in kind of the initial run of this series on our YouTube channel. And uh, after there was you know three or four of those online that were getting a lot of views, we began getting contacted probably by 25 production companies who were like, we want to develop this guy, this, this show with you guys. And uh, long story short, we ended up partnering with Reveille, uh and IFC picked up the show and it ran for a season. And it was the, the main reason that we moved out to, to L.A. Yeah. So you moved out for the show and then you stayed out there. Since. Right. Got it. Um, and Lance, can you talk a little about the Mortal Kombat project in detail? Because I think that would be a good one as an example of something that crossed over. Yeah, I mean, that's a crazy one. We, um, and, and I was, I, I call it old school and new school. I was doing something in the old school space. I was, w w my company, um, we, we were making a movie called Act of Valor about the Navy SEALs. And we released that last year. And, you know, it was a kind of an interesting process. We did it off grid. We were kind of on our own. And Warner kept coming back to me saying, hey, come back and work for us and run this digital area. <clears throat> and I was like, what do you, you know, what do you really, do you really want to experiment? They said yes. They gave me full commitment that we were going to really push the envelope and do some really innovative things. And I uh, started talking with, you guys know Mick G, the director and, and producer. So he had a project and we were developing that, and I agree. I read the script. He had an awesome script, and, and I said, all right, I'll do it. I'll do this if you guys commit to making this project. Um, and we were looking for a director, and um, this video came up on YouTube. Um, this kid came out of nowhere, essentially, and put up a, a video with Warner Brothers has the, owns the game franchise to Mortal Kombat as well, and I think they've, we've made 10. We're coming out with the 11th game of maybe sometime soon but so we had this franchise and this kid basically went out put up on YouTube a movie a short film that he made on Mortal Kombat our our franchise and um, it was interesting because the piracy lawyers at Warner Brothers had called me to say hey we're about to shut this guy down but it's really I mean I'm not saying it but it's really good <laughs> and and they gave me a link to it and it was like and it had been up for about a week and I think it had 10 million views on his own and, and I said, well, when are, you, when are you shutting them down? <laughs> and we watched the video, and I sent it to Mick G, and was like, you got to check this out. Like, it was really, I don't know if any of you had seen it, but it was really badass and gritty, and, I mean, he had a great cast. He, he pulled together, and he, with his own money, went and made this thing. So at 9 in the morning, we were arresting him for piracy, 
And by five in the afternoon, we were bringing him in to meet with him as a potential director for this McG series. And he came in, Mick G drove over to Warner Brothers, we sat down with him, and three minutes into the meeting, it was like, dude, we gotta, I, I, no disrespect to the, your project, but we have to try and realize this kid's vision with Mortal Kombat. And meanwhile, I'd sent the video link to like our top executives, our CEO of the company now was one of them, <laughs> and there became this instant fan base for this kid with our top, you know, top guys in the theatrical part of our company. And you know, I said to the kid, I was like, maybe, uh, maybe we take a walk over and meet the guys, you know? And, and ultimately, we did. We walked over, and, and our chairman, Kevin Sujihara, was, was in a meeting, and, and he came out, and he was all excited to meet this little guy, you know, who was this filmmaker. And he was like, what are you guys doing? And I said, well, I think, you know, we were going to maybe consider this. His name's Kevin Tantrone, the, the director. We're going to consider him as a director for AIM High, this McG show. But, you know, I think there's a, a possibility we should try and do Mortal Kombat. We have a game coming out, and maybe we sync up with the game. And basically, we got a green light at that. And, you, and he, li he looked at me, the chairman looked at me and said, you know, how much will that cost? And I was like, uh, I don't know, a million dollars? Like, I didn't know. We didn't have a script or anything to budget off of. And he, and he was like, all right. So the awesome thing was... It was literally from that day to when we released our first episode, we ended up partnering with a multi-channel network, Machinima, to distribute it. It was four months from that day of meeting that kid to when we actually launched, created, wrote, created, edited, and distributed this, this movie, yeah. essentially. Four months. Like, in our world, that doesn't happen. You know, you're lucky if it's you know, 14 years. Yeah. For a film, you know. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, the, um, I, I think that that's something that you know people that have run YouTube channels before sort of, you know, are surprised by how long the process can take sometimes in TV. I'm um, curious, I guess, from you know Steve and really all of you in terms of sort of balancing that process that can take a while but still maintaining a YouTube fan base. If you have any advice for creators and how you guys, as creators, have done that, kind of pursued those projects while still trying to keep the the YouTube fans happy, you know. Um, yeah, so f for me, it's actually, it's so funny because <clears throat> these kids on YouTube who have created these channels and, and huge audiences cannot understand why it takes so long, exactly, sort of like what he was saying with, with, with Kevin. Um, but you just have to encourage them to be patient, and they have to trust you, and you have to trust them to you know, keep doing what they're doing. And, and while they're pursuing their interest in the film and television side, you know, continue to maintain their channels and make sure that their fan bases are not leaving them because it is something that a lot of the YouTube stars that I work with really worry about. And eventually what happens, the more successful that they get, the less time they have. They just, they all work incredibly hard. They sometimes bring on people to, you know, hire people to edit. And, you know, these are people who have done everything from, you know, soup to nuts for their entire careers and lives. And they have a bit of a separation anxiety with, you know, their videos because they're, they're, you know, sort of babies. So, you know, the only thing you can do is, is preach patience to them, but to trust the process and that, you know, if they keep doing what they're doing, they're going to be able to transition in the way that they want to. Yeah, and you have to, like, you, you can't do it just to get views, you have to actually have a passion for it and be interested in it. I think a lot of people go into it to get views and to get millions of views, and it doesn't work out like that. And so it's very lackluster. But um, yeah, you have to be you have to be passionate in it. Yeah, and you have to you have to like what you're doing. So. Well, at the flip side to that, and then I mean, stop me, but it was it was pretty amazing in that four month period of time. I was my other part of my job was producing a feature film for the studio, and I was doing it with Robert Downey Jr. And we were in development on it, and he had flown a rider in to actually moved into his home, and we were working every day. We would start at 6 a.m., and we'd work until about 2 in the afternoon, manically. Like, they, Robert is a genius when it comes to developing the script and working with the writer. And, and I was there, kind of, I'm an ADD guy, so it was, I was having a hard time, like, staying engaged in the, you know, we were on page 3, and it was, you know, two months later, that kind of thing. And so while we were producing Mortal Kombat, I was in his offices, in his home, really. And I, you know, I had to borrow his computer and use his phones and use his conference room. So he got to kind of watch this whole process just from the sidelines. But it was so awesome because he was fascinated. He, he got 
just engaged by, I want to say by accident, but just seeing the whole process, you know, me hearing about meeting this kid and, and then seeing from, you know, our timeline from actually hearing about it to the launch. And then seeing the, the day we launched, he was like the first guy probably online watching. And he was just blown away at the comments and just the views. And it was like, I would get a text message from him every 20 minutes. Like, you know, you're at 2 million views or you're at, and you should, he would cut and paste comments. Yeah. And like, it got to the point, a week into it, he was like, we're, we're at 10 million views. Yeah. And he was so, in, and he was like, I mean, manic, his approach on just, like, scouring the YouTube and looking. And then I got a call from him, like, two weeks later, and he was like, I need to meet with you. And I was like, okay. And I think he's going to, like, back out of our movie project with the studio. And, you know, it's, that's the fear of a producer when you go, with, especially when he's like, hey, I got to have a meeting with you. Like, yeah. he never had that kind of, conver you know, call with me. So I get to his office, and, and he shuts the door, and he's like, you know, I'm a little bit upset. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, you came into my house and you used my, comp you used my personal laptop, you used my phone, you used my conference room, you, people were working for you, and, like, you did this thing basically, you know, under my roof. And, like, uh, you, know, you know, you don't want to do anything like that with me? Yep, yep. <laughs> and it was awesome because, like, he was so into it. I'm like, first off, Robert, you don't even – the economics on, on this stuff right now, like, <laughs> uh, no disrespect, but you don't come – down the stairs for these meetings, the per diem for the lunches don't cover right. our budget. Right, right. And then, but then, the, and then you, I'll stop. But I think it's just fascinating to see that those two worlds collide. You know, then he was like, "You think I was upset before? Now I'm so angry." He was, he said, "You think I'm about the money?" And it was like, <laughs> anyways. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Um, my next question is: I have seven waters here. Do you guys? Any guys want a water? No, we're good. Okay. <laughs> All right, just making sure. Um, and so nine at full screen. I mean, you guys have how many creators are part of the full screen network? So we have thirty thousand channels that we work with, and they run the gamut of anyone from fifteen thousand subscribers to seven million subscribers. Yeah, and and of those, are how would you kind of like categorize the? Are there a group that are sort of on YouTube but are actively pursuing other opportunities, some that have full-time jobs and they're on YouTube, some that YouTube is their living and they'd be happy with that for the next 20 years? Yeah, I think with 30,000 channels, you're going to find a little bit of you know, all of those things within the network. We have people that are in our network that work at full screen. Um, we have people that, uh, for instance, Lo Anthony is uh, a young pop YouTube channel who has been growing very quickly on the platform and um, we saw him, this is, this is somebody who just made videos in their bedroom and was able to cultivate a very, very massive and engaged following, mainly of uh, tween girls. But uh, he did a small program for, <laughs> for the show uh, Teen Wolf. And uh, it was what was once a small promotion. It was just a tune-in uh, call to action to his fans, which now turned into him hosting an after party on MTV.com. So, yeah, we're seeing some of these uh, emerging channels grow so quickly that they're getting opportunities that are more traditional and you know stuff that aligns with um, other agencies are getting opportunities from all walks of life and then for the middle channels you know our job is really to foster them and help them emerge so that they are amongst the top YouTube channels and we can do uh, so my job mainly is to work with brands um, brands wanting to be content creators and content creators wanting to be brands in and of themselves and um, and once you hit a certain threshold, then we can do some really cool integrations and uh, really cool branded opportunities. So, I mean, to answer your question, yeah, I think it's a little bit of everything. And we, we realize that influencers and channels come in all shapes and sizes. And we're really, you know, here to handhold them to the next level of their career, depending on where they are. Nice. All right, so uh, for Rhett and Link and Josh, the, I'm sure you get asked sort of, your overall most important advice for people thinking of starting a YouTube channel? Got a kind of top line, most important uh, things to consider? First of all, don't. <laughs> don't start. We don't need any more competition. <laughs> Second of all, don't. Um, you know, it's funny because I, I feel like um, things have changed very dramatically uh, in the seven years that we've been doing this. And uh, actually started our, started our channel in 06, so it'll be eight years in June, which is just nuts to think about doing something for that long. But at the, to at the time, 
uh, it was very much anybody who was doing something that was funny and regular had a, had, had a great advantage. Uh, we've never had a real focus. You know, we do all kinds of genre. It's all funny, but it's all kinds of different videos. <clears throat> I think now you see a lot of people who have success where they kind of focus in on one angle, one thing over and over again. I think it's tough to kind of to, to see that success with a scatter shot approach like we've, we've had. We just kind of built this audience over many years. But you kind of have to try many different things to see what that, you can't predict what's going what's gonna to be the thing that's going to pop, but you have to be ready f to follow it up very quickly with more of it pretty much on a weekly basis if it does pop. So uh, I think it's kind of having the expectation that this is not easy, this is not automatic, but, you know, if something taps into your, your passion and you, you create something, it may or may not work, but then be ready if it does work to, uh, you know, to open the floodgates on continuing it. Even thinking of it that way, I would say of, okay, if this does work, this is how it happens in series. Yeah, yeah and I think you have to put a lot of work into it, unless it's like, you know, a cat video or something. You have to put work into it, and you have to, um, you know, spend some time on it, for the most part. I mean, I know the alls isn't just like, you know, some camcorder, let's do something. It's, you know, you plan it out, and you, um, you, have, to, you have to be ready to, to work. And, and if it's quick, good, oh, yeah, go ahead. and it pops on our, on our little engine tool, we will find you, <laughs> and we will contact you, and we will ask you to join. Uh, Steve, anything to add to that in terms of general <laughs> advice you give people? Yeah, I mean, just from our perspective, <coughs> for young people who want to make videos, the sobering truth is that you have to be talented in some way. But there is a lot of talented people out there, and what I would say to them is be incredibly consistent, work incredibly hard, do not be afraid to try, try new things, um, and don't be afraid to fail. You know, one of the most important things for any young creator is uh, creating an, abi an ability to learn from failure in any walk of life, really, um, because that's going to teach you for the next time how to be better. And don't let anybody get in your way. Don't let anybody's criticism stop you. Call in all your, fa all, all your favors. Find the money and go out and shoot stuff and make stuff. Um, and that's the best way to break through, in my opinion. Uh, on that note, anybody have anything to kind of tell a story about that maybe was a failure, a mistake you made that you thought you kind of knew the way YouTube would react and they reacted a different way? Yeah, I mean, I can jump in with that. So <clears throat> we have several guys who have created some online videos and, and were musically inclined. Um, you know, a guy that is one of my first clients ever who I just love dearly, dearly is this guy named John Lejoie, who, you know, in 2006 at the very beginning was making music hilarious music videos out of his basement in Montreal and one of the things we decided to do with him in addition to developing a television show and, and eventually getting where we are now which is, is his role on the league um, was having him go out and tour because he had a live act he's a wildly gifted musician and this guy was getting massive numbers at the time um, on his YouTube channel and we put his, his tickets on sale they didn't sell in the way that we thought they were going to so he went on the road, he made a bunch of videos, he encouraged all of his people to buy tickets, he did a ton of press, he did all of the stuff that, you know, a hardworking comedian or band has to do, and eventually we got his ticket sales there, and, you know, I work with this kid called Sam Pepper, who I'm sure a lot of you people know who is also going to be going out on tour, um, and uh, that's being promoted by Live Nation, which is obviously a big deal, and we put the ticket sales out, the same exact thing happened to him as it did for John, because... All the people who consume his videos are clicking on it for free, right? And now we're asking young people to go and buy tickets. And, you know, the kid has worked incredibly hard. He's gone on tour with some of his other band, or excuse me, other buddies who are in bands in the UK, in the US. He's going to the cities. He's doing promotions. He's doing giveaways. He's connecting to his fans in the way that we always preach for our young people to do. And the guy's turning it around, and now he's going to go and sort of, I think, in the spring, go to New York, Chicago, Austin at South by Southwest, and it's, uh, it's going to be an unbelievable thing for the guy to realize his dream. Nice. Any other mistakes from the group that you learned from? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, one of the early mistakes uh, that we'd made is we would identify a channel, and they had millions of uh, views ac across every video and a lot of subscribers, 
And their format, so the tone of their video that they did every week was a handheld kind of selfie video, um, you know, talking and blogging about weekly life. And we really wanted to take advantage of all of the viewership that that channel was getting, so we worked with the brand, and uh, the brand decided that the, the quality of the content wasn't really up to par with what they wanted to do. And so we said, all right, I, I get that. You guys, you know, are na household name brand. And we allowed them to actually do a higher production video on that channel, and it failed because the fan base and the audience that this influencer had cultivated was really used to seeing this format, and they really liked it. And, then, and they had this connection with this influencer. And so what the takeaway really was is that you, you can't really change the format. A brand can't go on to an integration on a channel and think that you know, they're going to be able to have a better messaging to an audience than the influencer itself. So the takeaway was uh, if we want to do a brand integration, let's keep it organic to what's actually working on that channel and in true format to what the, the content already is that is already getting all these views. Cool. Did you guys have any uh, mistakes, lessons? Uh, we make many mistakes. <laughs> we don't admit to any of them okay. publicly. <laughs> well, I'd say the, probably the biggest thing is uh, a few years back when Fergie was a part of our uh, little trio here, we gave her over to Black Eyed Peas. That was a... <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> It was a monumental mistake. Yeah. Good for them, bad for you. Uh, cool. Well, uh, I have a couple more questions here, but it might be good to first go to the audience for some questions and get a sense for what you guys are looking to hear about. Anybody from the uh, audience here have questions about YouTube or discovery on YouTube? I found you, probably. You just realized who we were? I just realized who you were. When we said Fergie? Yeah, what was the trigger? Fergie. Exactly. I realized who you guys are. My They're the God. Black Eyed Peas. I just found you on YouTube just, just, a just couple for of weeks ago. Just for clarity, Seriously. can you tell the people who we are? Well, are you from Chicago? Mm. You're from no. the Midwest. The South, but you know. It's a, All right. Same thing. It's a part of so the United far, States. Player, piano player. So far, so good. Piano player? Yes. No. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> You're doing great. I still know who you guys are, but I did just discover you recently. So... And, and then I passed it around to a whole bunch of people. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to pass the mic around. Nice job, guys. Really impressive uh, to listen to you guys. So my daughter is sitting on the left. She's 13 years old. And she's one of those teeny boppers. And if uh, she wanted a little advice of how she would get started on YouTube, would any of you guys uh, want to tell her? Give her some advice. <laughs> Advice for the teeny bopper. You could vlog about how your dad embarrasses you in public. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people will relate to that. That's awesome. Are we brainstorming? Because, yeah. okay. Well, I interestingly enough, um, I have a nine-year-old son. He has an eight-year-old son, and they recently came to us and said, we want to start a YouTube channel. Come on. And, and I was like, I should have, we should have been prepared for this. <laughs> So we didn't have an talk. answer. Uh, <laughs> so we're actually in the process of figuring out, okay, well, can they do this? What, what role would we play? And would, would we point anybody to this? But they're both really into, um, into Nerf, right? And so the Nerf guns, constantly, Dad, I'm going to mod this gun sort of situation. And there are all these YouTube channels with kids a little bit older than them that are totally Nerf-focused. And so I was like, well, that's what you guys are into. I think it's just finding something that you're into that you want to, because you, you become a part of a community, right? So it's a, you, you enter into the YouTube community. It isn't like, oh, I just create my channel, but that is your entry point into the community. And you're usually going to connect with other people who care about the things that you care about, have a, have a similar perspective. And so you into Nerf? <laughs> I, I, I yeah. Okay, I, that works too. I, I completely agree with that. And the other thing that you should think about is when you enter into that community, it's also going to be more fun for you. And if it's fun for you, you're going to put stuff out that you really like. You're going to do it with your friends. And it's going to become a real part of your life as it has for anybody who's been successful in this space. So um, I have a question for Rhett and Link. Like, I know you guys do like the short videos, like how to kill the mustache and like all that stuff. How do you balance it with like your longer form, like, Good Mythical Morning and like your podcast and stuff. Like, how do you find the time to like? Uh, the question was, how do we balance creating 
short form comedic videos with the fact that we have a second channel that is a daily talk show uh, called Good Mythical Morning. Basically unedited 10 minute conversation. Um, it, it's, I, I think the, the interesting thing is that, you know, I think a lot of people have talked about consistency. You know, we, we certainly aspire to have a consistency in terms of our, is something funny and a certain production value, but there's extreme value in uh, just getting things out there on a, on a schedule. And for us, you know, it, it doesn't get better than daily if you can do something that maintains a high, uh, it maintains high standards. So uh, we actually put a lot of effort into that, into our daily talk show, even though it's, it seems pretty simple, just two guys talking for 10 minutes, but it creates that connection. It creates that schedule of consistency that's really important for anything that we release on our main channel that's a sketch that we want to go big and get millions of views where we're relying on that core fan base of Good Mythical Morning who's committed to watching us talk every day and, and sharing our videos. I mean, and practically the way that it happens now um, is, you know, people have mentioned branded projects a couple of times. That's something we've done right from the beginning. It was really one of the first things that we did before the partnership program, before you could, you know, actually see ad money through AdSense on YouTube. We were partnering directly with brands and agencies. We continue to do that. And so we're a little bit of a, we work directly with agencies and brands. We get the AdSense money from views, but we develop those custom campaigns. That gives us the capital to have a production company. So we have a, a, a seven-person team, including the two of us. So we, you know, we produce everything that you see on our channels. Um, and we, you know, we can only do that because we say yes to these branded projects and, and get the larger fees so we can pay, have a payroll of five additional people. Cool. Other questions? I do have one for Josh, if you guys are thinking of some. I'm just really curious. You put out YouTube videos. You see all the comments pouring in, and yesterday your movie debuted, right, in front of a packed house, I assume. What was sort of the difference for you in sort of those two experiences, you know, seeing a movie debut and, you know, an, an audience full of people live there in person versus sort of the feedback you get from yeah. YouTube? Yeah, it's, it's weird. I'm not just doing it with my buddies on my street. I'm doing it with Aaron Paul and Juliet Lewis, <laughs> and uh, it's... You know, in the whole theater, everyone's kind of responding to it. You can see, you can see that, you know, the reactions, their vocal reactions. And it's just all just, it's very surreal, and it's, it's very, um, I don't know, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Did you learn anything from Aaron Paul? Any good tips and tricks? Yeah, yeah, he, uh, you know, he told me, keep a level head through all this, because, you know, Aaron's the most down-to-earth guy. And just, you know, building off, off your other actors and... Uh, how important that is, and, and uh, yeah, something like that. Cool. Other questions from the group here? Yeah, I'm going to give you the mic. Uh, I've got just kind of a comment, maybe in a question, for Nina and the gentleman. Steve. Steve and... Nina. <laughs> and with Warner Bros... What's your name? Lance. Lance, okay. So kind of a comment and kind of like uh, a question as well. So yeah. in YouTube and with YouTube, this phenomenon yeah. of people massively sharing very sincere content and good quality content. Like, the, my comment is like how excited I am to see like that coming into mainstream. I'm just, I'm like, because of the, some of the crap that comes out in Hollywood, it's just, I'm so excited to see that maybe move away, and just <laughs> go away. So thank you YouTube and everybody creating like good quality. So I was just wondering if you guys, are seeing uh, any maybe the studio people or seeing that kind of like adopting maybe more of that sincere approach or like, you know, I mean, there's the good quality, but but also the unmasked like You mean like a more humanity. organic approach yeah, to like marketing right, right. films yeah. and TV, that kind of thing? Definitely, yeah. like we're seeing, there is that line, like, we, you know, we, it's a fine line for, for us. And I think it's a double-edged sword too, as every day goes by. But just the credibility that we see on our stuff with YouTube, like that is such an eye opener for the entire company, which is one of the things that's kind of most awesome about making this stuff is that you get the guy who's been, you know, a distribution guru for all the theater chains for, for years. And that's like a, 
a art form in itself, but you get that guy to see the light on a, a video on YouTube, um, and that's pretty amazing. So, yeah, I, th I think that um, you know the sincerity for some of these, you know, the sincerity of the tone of these videos. It, it really comes from you guys, and it comes from everybody who's watching and commenting and communicating back. And so when you look at kind of traditional video and traditional movies, TV, what have you, the, if you aren't working with talent that doesn't have a way to have a two-way conversation with the audience, then I don't know if we're ever going to be able to see that sincerity without that communication. Because the sincerity really comes as a response to questions and comments that are coming from the audience. And with, uh, with traditional television and, and movies, you, you don't get that unless, again, the talent has a massive Twitter following, so, which takes a, a lot of time to and, cultivate. And for me, that, that comment actually touches on one of the most important issues that the entire industry faces at the moment because the studio system basically represents a distribution network, right, where they pay money to creators, they create stuff, and then they disseminate it out to the universe. And people on YouTube and the other, you know, different outlets and, and, and formats online have allowed the audience to, sp or excuse me, the creator to direct, uh, excuse me, speak directly to the audience. And that's an incredibly scary thing for the studios, right? So, <clears throat> as you can imagine. So what they've done in a smart way is, is come to us and say, okay, who do you have that we can put in this movie that can help the movie be bigger? So that we get to do what we do and you guys get to take those people and help them along on their career. Because, again, like I would mentioned earlier, a lot of these guys start because they want to be writers, directors, actors, like Josh. Um, and it's the way that we can all work together. And, you know, a couple examples of that where we've had some success is I represent a kid named John Baker whose online handle is Spoken Reasons. Uh, he's a young African-American kid who we signed him and introduced him to... Um, a great casting director, Allison Jones, who then introduced him to Paul Feig, who directed that movie, The Heat, who fell in love with him immediately and cast him in the fourth lead of the movie because um, he is a gifted guy who just had found his start in another way. So he puts him in the movie. He's having a great time. He's out on the streets of Boston getting recognized more than Sandra Bullock, and she's like, who are you, dude? Um, and, and they made a great movie, but one of the interesting things that we've been able to, we were able to do at that time is with Fox, who is the studio, is go to them and have them pay him, you know, a very significant sum to make seven videos directly catered to his audience promoting the movie, right? So they paid him X amount of dollars. He got to keep all the, the underages, I guess, um, is the term. And he made a significant amount of money, a lot more than he did for his services on the film. Um, and similarly, I represent a guy um, called Jimmy Tatro, who sort of makes videos that, you know, glorify college life and introduced him to a great casting director, Jeannie McCarthy, who then introduced him to Lord and Miller, who were directing 22 Jump Street and also directed the first movie. Um, and it was a smaller part. They met him. They basically wrote up the part to be the fifth lead of the movie, which is an insane thing. Um, and now he's, you know, been working with Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum making these videos where we were also we're going to make a deal with Sony for him to do that. They're going to do a big college tour. They're going to do this crazy thing. And, and this is a guy who's a brilliant guy that just didn't have the exposure or the access. And now Lord and Miller are going to go and develop a television show with him. And he's really off to the races as like a young comedic star. Wait, I have, a, I have something to add about the heat campaign. So at full screen, we actually we ran a, an advertising campaign to promote the heat. And we, it was an influencer campaign where we had dozens of influencers uh, talk about the heat opening in theaters within the first 30 seconds of their video. And they talked about Jenny McCarthy, they talked about, I'm, I'm sorry, they talked about Sandra Bullock and Melissa McCarthy, and uh, the comments in all of these influencers' threads were all about spoken reasons. Yeah. And, and when we get the feedback from the studios where they'll like tweet or they'll send out a post, and, and UTA have an incredibly sophisticated research department, and we've allocated resources to them to basically track this and follow this. And when Jimmy was like posting about the movie or when JV was posting about um, the heat, they would call us and ask why their numbers were spiking in an insane way. And I, I basically said, well, I'm glad you trusted me to put these guys in the movie because we told you it was going to happen and now it's happening. So that they feel good about their investment. And it's just, it's been an awesome thing for these young guys and, and for us. It, it goes back to what Rhett and Link were saying about the community. So you enter this community and you're, you're kind of nurtured and fostered 
by this community. So it kind of makes sense in hindsight that uh, all the comments would be about JB, Spoken Reasons, uh, because he's within the community and the people who you're advertising to are also a part of that community. Cool. Um, I think that's about our time, right? Is it 3.30? Uh, I want to make sure I get the names of the projects you guys are working on. If they want to find you guys, youtube.com slash Rhett and Link, right? Yes. Your movie is tomorrow, playing again, right? Is yes. it possible to still get tickets? Um, I believe so. <laughs> I uh, I'm not sure. In is case it, it is. When is it tomorrow? Um, Cat? All right. Uh, Hellion. It's called Hellion. Hellion. Uh, um, it premiered yesterday, but there's a showing today, and there's a showing that uh, Kat was talking about tomorrow. And so. Is it already distri- got a distributor and all that? I don't so believe so. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Lance, anything I should uh, they should know World about? Combat, we, we, that's up and live right now, and H plus. H plus. Nina, is it fullscreen.com to learn more about the network? Yeah, it's a uh, full. Go to full screen. Well, I think you really have to go to all of our big influencers. There, if you go to the, if you go to .net, then you're, you know, you'll you'll get a lot of information. But you really should check out some of our biggest channels: the Fine Brothers, our Second Life, Lo Anthony, um, filmmaker Devin Supertramp, and uh, musician Lindsey Sterling are some of our biggest channels that you guys should t- check out. Check those out, Steve. Anything they should check out on your? No, I mean, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing for me to check out. Or for Steve.com. Uh, che- no, <laughs> not quite. I would just say for all the young people, go to the movies, watch TV, consume videos online, and go and make stuff. What's your Twitter handle? No. <laughs> there you go. All right, cool. Thanks for coming, guys. And uh, that's it for the panel. Thank you.